May God's word be spoken and may God's word be heard. Amen. Amen. One of the ways in which I felt affirmed to a call to the priesthood and to preach was that every time I heard a sermon, even the ones I really liked, I would think, or as Devin and I talked on the way home, I would say, if I were the preacher today, I would have talked about something completely different. Truth be told, I remember these lectionary readings today coming up at least twice in my adulthood and thinking both times, that poor person. I am so glad that I didn't have to preach. Here's the funnier part. Both of these preachers that I happened to hear were both bishops. You might be wondering, what did they talk about? Well, I can tell you what they didn't talk about because it was so memorable. What they didn't talk about were the readings for today. <laughs> Instead, they both focused on today's opening collect. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them. Read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them. It's a great collect. We should hear, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest scripture. But what do we do with scripture that makes us squirm or leaves us wondering how to make sense of it? What do you do with scripture that makes you wince or do a double take? Or thank the Lord that you didn't bring your Jewish friend with you to church today. Or someone completely new to Christianity. Because there just isn't enough time in the space of the service to unpack everything. Scripture is the story of our branch of God's people going back thousands of years. Even before recorded time and an oral tradition that was passed down until it could be written down and then passed down again from generation to generation. It has helped all of those generations of people make sense of the world and their lives through storytelling and story interpretation. I like to think of scripture as a sort of open community diary, full of our ancestors' hurts and joys, things that they're proud of, and things that they'd like to hide, and their growing and changing understandings of God, full of many voices, some more poetic and literary, others more literal, and some paradoxically at odds with one another. The voices are just as varied as our voices today. As Episcopalians and as Anglicans, we believe that we should use our full selves and all the tools of scholarship at our disposal to help us understand how God is speaking to, to us now through scripture. We do not have to check our brains or our hearts or our past experiences at the door. We do not have to put on a mask and pretend that we're better or smarter or more perfect people. In fact, leaving any of ourselves behind is an impediment to hearing what God wants us to hear right now. God wants all of us to show up. As Episcopalians, a large part of how we read scripture is context. We look at the context of the passage. What happens before and after the passage of scripture that we're reading? What's the history? Who probably wrote this? When did they write this? And to whom were they writing? How has it been interpreted across time? How does it interact with other scripture? Many times, I wish that we had never stopped writing the Bible. 
that each generation got to contribute a book or an epistle, that we can add a chapter about how we see God moving in our lives and world today, right now. I once said this in a seminary class, and the only thing the very verbose New Testament professor said was a halting, wow. I couldn't tell if it was a good well or a bad well, but I stand by it. So what is God telling us, telling you right now in today's readings and in the story of your life? If you were tasked with writing the epistle of you, the gospel according to you, what would you write? Or rather, what are you writing? Because you are writing an epistle, a gospel, every day. It goes to your friends and family and co-workers and everyone whom you meet. It goes to people who have given up completely on Christianity and the people who are wondering what this whole Christian thing is about. You may or may not use religious words when you share your epistle, your gospel, but you are still sharing it. And when appropriate, I'd love to encourage you to share it with the words and images that we use here in church, because if we don't celebrate and define what our words and images mean as Christians, others will define and interpret them on our behalf. Today's gospel and Old Testament readings point to what is often called the apocalypse. We might call it the end of the world or the end times. Since Jesus' death, this has been a topic that Christians have returned to again and again. There is a ton of fantastic apocalypse art from the Middle Ages, from people that thought the end of the world was very near. On this day in 1833, all over North America, Christians saw stars falling out of the sky and were convinced that the world was ending. We now know this phenomenon as the Leonid meteor shower that happens every November. It's supposed to peak later this week, if you'd like to go out in the middle of the night and see. At the end of the 1990s, Jerry Farwell and others had many convinced that the year 2000 would be the end of the world. The Left Behind series has sold over 80 million copies all over the world in different languages. Perhaps you yourself were frightened when you were growing up by promises and descriptions of apocalypse and hell on earth. The truth is that all of us are living in the end times. Our life here is for a season, a hundred years at most. If we look at the larger context of our readings today, we see that the apocalypse is a literary genre that is often used in the Bible. It's used by the Old Testament prophets and in the New Testament, like the book of Revelation. It might sound strange to our ears today, but apocalypse is a genre of comfort. Truth is being revealed. This present suffering will end. God, the keeper of all, sees you and your struggles, and they are ending soon. The evil actions in this world will have a clear and swift consequence. Stories in the apocalypse genre are usually written by and for communities that are undergoing great suffering. Their purpose is hope. If we look at the gospel's immediate context, we see that Luke is written about 50 years after the death of Jesus in the wake of the takeover of Jerusalem and the violent destruction of the temple. The things that the writers of Luke are describing, imprisonment, conflict, 
betrayal, persecution. These are all happening to the early church and to those who would have heard Luke. How comforting it must have been to hear from Jesus about the larger safety that God holds all of us in during these present crises. The writers of Luke are remembering the life and sayings of Jesus and speaking them into their own community. And they still, still speak to us today. That epistle, that gospel you're writing every day of your life, it's your witness to God in your life. And the world needs it. We have more than a few crises going on right now. And Jesus gives us some good advice today. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom. Trust. Trust that in every situation where you seek to be a channel of God's light and love, that you will be given the words that you need to speak and that you will be nudged into the best action. Trust that God is holding you in this moment and will give you what you need to say. Our job is to listen as best as we can, which is another way of saying to pray as best as we can. The more we listen, the better we hear, not just God, but also the person we're with and God working in and through that other person. The deeper we listen, the better we can read the scripture, not only on the page, but also the scripture that God continues to write in all of our hearts. Amen.